LegalizeFreedom.com Why are we here? Where do we come from? Where are we going? From the nature of reality to the future of humanity. Listen without limits. Unchain your brain. Change your thinking. Change your life. LegalizeFreedom.com Greetings and welcome once again to LegalizeFreedom.com. I'm your host Greg Moffat and my guest today is John Michael Greer, who joins us to discuss his book, The King in Orange, The Magical and Occult Roots of Political Power. Magic and politics seem like unlikely bedfellows, but in The King in Orange, Greer reveals the unmentionable realities that spawned the unexpected presidential victory of an elderly real estate mogul turned reality TV star, and which continue to drive the deepening divide that is now the defining characteristic of American society. Greer convincingly shows how two competing schools of magic were led to contend for the presidency in 2016 and details the magical war that took place behind the scenes of the campaign. The author shows that the main contenders in this war were the status quo state, deploying the manipulative subliminal techniques of modern advertising and an older, deeper and less reasonable form of magic, the magic of the excluded which was employed by chaos magicians and alt-right internet wizards whose desires led the assault against the world we knew. Examining in detail the magical actions of Trump's opponents, Greer discusses how the magic of the privileged has functioned to keep the comfortable classes from being able to respond effectively to the populist challenge, and why the magic resistance which tried to turn magic against Trump has failed. Showing how the political and magical landscape of American society has now permanently changed, Greer reveals that understanding the coming of the King in Orange will be a crucial step in making sense of the world for a long time to come. Hello and welcome, John, and thank you so much for joining us once again on LegalizeFreedom.com. Well, thank you for having me back on. I always enjoy being on here. It's been three years, believe it or not, since our last talk. I know, where does the time go? And uh, certainly the last 12 months, for obvious reasons, has felt like it's just almost not happened, but it has. It's passed by. Just not very much has happened during it. Um, Now, you've got a new book coming out um, in the summer, in June, I believe. Mm -hmm. And this is entitled The King in Orange, The Magical and Occult Roots of Political Power. Now, I've said a little word about that in my recorded introduction. Before we get into it uh, properly, for listeners who don't know, just give them a little potted bio. Of, of me, yes. <laughs> um, let's see, I grew up in the in the suburbs of, of Seattle. Um, I got interested in strange things early on. We, you know, suburban life is not what it's cracked up to be. It's really dull, and so I got interested in a range of strange things. So one thing led to another. I spent uh, twelve years as the Grand Arch Druid of a Druid Order. I've written seventy some books. Um, that's what I do for a living, and. Um, I blog regularly and um, usually find myself on the unpopular side of most points of view, and I, I suspect um, a fair number of our, of our listeners. Uh, when they, when, you know, I would encourage them to get a copy of the book, but be aware, they will want to throw it across the room at least once. Well, the, the book in itself um, is, uh, it makes a lot of uh, general points about um, political power and how the how the systems function and the role of mm-hmm. uh, propaganda and advertising and whatnot in our culture. But the king in orange in the title is a reference to Donald Trump, now ex U.S. president, and and the title that title in itself references a, a work of fiction called The King in Yellow, which I, I had actually heard of. So, but if readers are interested. In the background to that, you did, uh, you've just done an interview with another one of my guests, uh, James mm-hmm. Howard Constler, and, oh, yeah. and you've set out a lot of the background there. So perhaps we can start by just rewinding a little bit to Trump's election victory, because it was a most curious thing to watch, particularly for a non-American, but the sheer degree of it's an unprecedented meltdown 
um, of those people who were, whether they were Democrats or not, I mean, they could be Republicans or somewhere in between, but they were repelled by Donald Trump and the very idea of him becoming uh, president. But, I mean, as you said in your book, the, the opposition parties, when they lose elections, they always throw their toys out of the pram, but they've never, ever seen anything like this. And mm-hmm. rather than the few weeks after the election where they kind of gradually come to terms with it, I mean, even I was staggered all the way throughout uh, Trump's mm-hmm. presidency. They never let up for a minute. They just couldn't accept that reality was mm-hmm. what it was. Mm-hmm. That's that's quite correct. Um, the problem, the, the difficulty here, and the difficulty that that almost everybody has had dealing with the Donald Trump phenomenon is that it touches on one of the taboo subjects in modern American culture, which is social class. In America today, we like to talk about race, we like to talk about gender, we like to talk about other um, ca- various categories, but you do not talk about class issues, and if you do, if you stray into there, all that you talk about are the very, very rich and the very, very poor. You don't talk about the bulk of the population. The major class conflict in America today, in America today, is between uh, the professional managerial class, the the middle, to, the middle to upper end of the middle class, say the top twenty percent, and the lower eighty percent, the working class, and. People in the managerial class will, sit, will insist they're opposed to class warfare, which is nonsense. They love class warfare. The warfare of the middle classes against the working class has been the dominant theme of American politics for 50 years. But you don't talk about it. And the thing that made Donald Trump untouchable, the thing that made people melt down and then melt down on top of their melting down and then go from molten to vapor, um, was that he appealed to the working classes. He made his pitch to work, you know, he wore his, you know, his red MAGA hat. Can you imagine Hillary Clinton wearing so proletarian a garment with everybody just sort of coming unglued? Um, He pitched to the working classes, the people who were supposed to be silenced, the people who in our culture, we don't talk about, we erase their existence. And that threatened, of course, the monopoly of power on the part of the professional managerial classes. And so, of course, they came completely unglued. Well, I always think back when I think of the trajectory of industrial civilization in, in the, as it, we moved from the 20th century into the 21st, I always think back to Francis Fukuyama's book, The End of History, and what a total joke. I mean, I can't believe that any <laughs> any sort of public intellectual would come out with something like that. But anyway, history didn't end. Uh, uh-huh. the, the neoliberal uh, consensus did not prevail. We've gone from post-modern to like just but pretty much post-everything, really, at the minute. But despite, as you say, history or despite you know, reality not serving up what people were told to expect, there's still been an artificial consensus, a general mm-hmm. idea that the direction of travel may get nudged a bit off from time to time. But overall, you know, what you talk about is the myth of progress still prevails. Mm-hmm. One thing that the election of Trump did was that sort of illusion of inevitability about it all. As I say, you know, you might get a bit of an upset in the system. Someone like Bernie, mm-hmm. Bernie Sanders comes along, but he got shut down. Mm-hmm. But I think that illusion of inevitability has now been shattered. And mm-hmm. I, I mean, obviously there's a lot of people with the best interest to just basically want the whole Trump episode to vanish and never be repeated again. But the, the game has changed mm-hmm. now. And I don't think, I don't think we've seen the last of that tendency, shall we say. If it, if it isn't no, Trump, I mean, I think you, no, no, the, this, this is, the, the game has changed. Mm-hmm. The, the whole point in focusing on Trump is precisely so that people can pretend that the game has not changed, that it's just this bizarre, irrational uh, presence like, like, like Sulu in, um, in H.P. Lovecraft's fiction, you know, this sort of nightmare presence rising from the deeps, um, unimaginable, unthinkable to, to disrupt the, the comfortable world of our comfortable classes. But in fact, this is the necessary blowback to 50 years of policies that have, priv- that have benefited the middle class at the expense of the working class. Um, the, the thing that, I, I mean, people, people are aware of it, but they're not aware of it. When I was a teenager, um, a family of four in, a, in the United States with one working class income could afford a home, they could afford a car, they could afford three square meals a day, they could afford a normal life. Today, 
a family of four with one working class income is living on the street. It is it, that change has happened. That's really the most explosive political event of, of our time, and nobody's willing to talk about it. We all pretend it did not happen, and we certainly don't talk about what the policies were that made it happen, who benefited from those policies, and why they were shoved into place by a part by a bipartisan consensus that still defends them. That was an important part of what happened in the 2016 election, and that still very much a live factor today. The mere fact that um, you know the, the Joe, Biden, Joe Biden's handlers managed to pull off a um, a very 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 narrow win for their sock puppet um, that doesn't change any of what made the Trump phenomenon happen, and it's certainly not going to prevent more things from happening as time goes on. I remember. Uh, watching the various candidacies of Ron Paul in the past and him sometimes choosing to run as a Republican, sometimes as an independent. Mm -hmm. um, I'm wondering if Trump, it's just a matter of opinion really, I suppose, because we can't talk to the guy, but I'm wondering if he instinctively knew that running for the Republic, no, Republican nomination was the way to go, or perhaps he was steered in that direction. I'd, I'd, I'd still like to know what the thought processes were of him and the people around him leading up to the point where he said actually i'm gonna i'm gonna run you know was there ever a question of being an independent mm -hmm. well the thing you have to remember is in the united states the electoral system is rigged so that it's very very difficult for a third party to get in the democrats and the republicans have written laws to their own benefit they've they've passed various things to keep that two-party duopoly bolted in place and that's why um you know, for for well over a century now, third parties have been have been um, marginalized completely. You know, they go through the motions, but they rarely can even get anybody on the ballot. And that's 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 a rain. That's part of our the, our, our <clears throat> quasi democratic system here. And so, in fact, if you want to make change in the United States, you pretty much have to make a beeline for one party or the other. Um, the Democrats are as vulnerable to this as the Republicans in nineteen in nineteen thirty two. What happened was that Franklin Delano Roosevelt succeeded in carrying out a takeover of the Democratic Party, which had previously been relatively conservative. And he pushed through his agenda. He had a bunch of people with him. He had a lot of people with him. And so they were able to take over the Democratic Party and move in, in a completely new direction. In the same way that takeover is happening in the Republican Party right now, as um, you know, to Trumpistas, as, as populist candidates, um, make a beeline for the Republican Party, use that as their platform, and um, you know they're moving the party, they're taking the party with them. And a lot of the Republican old guard is uh, screeching like a bunch of gutshot banshees right now, uh, because you know their nice, safe, comfortable party of privilege is being taken away from them. Well, the events of the last four years really have been another red flag, another marker in the trajectory that you've been charting for so long uh -huh. of industrial civilization. This is entirely predictable in a way, as chaotic as it seemed, the overall shape of events. Mm -hmm. I'm sure you said to yourself, "Why, well, of course, for all the people that were like, you know, scratching their heads, you were like, well, what did you expect? <laughs> well, actually, I was a little surprised. I did not. I, I knew that this, the social stresses between the, the the comfortable classes and the other eighty percent were rising toward toward crunch time. That was very clear. It was very clear that the professional and managerial classes were basically fixated on lining their own nests to the to you know at the expense of everyone else, and that this was going to produce some kind of political blowback. That it would take the shape that it did. That it would be as successful as it has been so far. And that it would continue, and and that it would cause the defenders of the status quo to go into a kind of schizoid breakdown. I had no idea that was going to happen. And watching watching them, they're still. I mean, they're still out there right now trying to impeach a president who left office. Yeah, that's one thing that I don't get. I think the people there, there's certainly a degree of a lack of understanding of how the system mm -hmm. works, but the fact that it's still all headline news, it's like, sorry, this is mental illness. You, you well, can't. Yes, yes, it is mental illness. What's the, but the, the thing again? You have to remember, they're fixated on the idea that it's all Trump. There can't be 
100 million Americans who are violently upset by what has been done to them by the system, who are violently upset by a system that's been rigged to benefit the upper 20% and screw the lower 80%, and that are willing to make their um, their displeasure known in the poll, in the polling places, in political action, and, and in other places as well. That's unthinkable. Because to, to our comfortable classes in America, they are the, they are history's actors. They are the only ones who take action. Everyone else is supposed to respond like marionettes when they pull the string. And since people aren't doing that, the marionettes are dancing to their own tune. And it's causing a complete nervous breakdown on the part of our, our would-be lords and masters. One of the interesting things, one of the interesting wrinkles in all this over the last year of the pandemic has been how vital many of the people in what you refer to as the wage class have actually been to the sort of uh, national social infrastructure, you know, mm -hmm. people hauling trash out, people stacking supermarket shelves, people, you know, janitors in hospitals keeping the place mm -hmm. clean. Uh, and that's been really interesting because, you know, people who were looked down upon by many of the political class, certainly in this country as well, mm -hmm. oh, uh, yeah. oh, beca yeah. became heroes overnight, you know, didn't they? <laughs> Oh well, they became heroes. They got their they got their fifteen minutes of media fame. Um, let's see if they're actually getting decent wages and decent benefits. Exactly, exactly. Well, that that will be one of the many things that will be interesting to see if this thing is ever declared over. But as we slowly move into perhaps a, a you know a looser situation, you know, will be an, mm -hmm. it's interesting to see what happens there. Whether it'll be that usual nod to concerns but then just quietly forgotten about i mean i think that just to repeat something i've basically already said i think we're getting to past that point it's going you know trump is out of the box so to speak you're not going to be able to like cram him back in or what trump represents what he was a symbol of yeah. you know mm -hmm. at, at this point frankly it's when trump finally leaves the political picture entirely and he's not out yet um first of all it's very clear that um, the, 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 chance, the, the chances that the Democrats have of actually passing an impeachment at this point are minimal if, if at best. And as long as he don't impeach, he can run in 2024. He, still ha he could still run for another term as president. Um, but that's actually not the most important thing right now. What's the, the important thing is actually happening at the grassroots. Um, even though the Democrats won the the presidency by a whisker. Um, they, the Democrats lost a lot of ground in the House. Um, they lost what was it? Something like nine or ten. They lost half the majority, basically, and they're struggling. And a lot of Democrats are looking at the next election and are going, "Oh boy, we are in so much trouble." And they are, because what's happening is that the, a lot of a lot of Republicans, a lot of the populists. They're they're heading to they're getting campaigns started. They're looking at taking local, state, and and congressional offices, building this uh, so that it's no longer one person but an entire movement. And that's not something that so the defenders the defenders of the status quo are prepared to deal with. Yeah, there was always it's always easy to target sort of outliers or people that stick their head, you know, sort of like a Ralph Nader type, mm -hmm. yeah. quixotic sort of figure. Um, that doesn't have the organization or, or what we'd call a movement, you know, that if something happens mm -hmm. to them, there's nothing there to take their place. Mm -hmm. So I think that you're definitely seeing the signs of that, as you say, and that people who did support Trump or what he stood for, I think mm -hmm. they're conscious of the fact that, you know, there's no time to wait now, you know, that the, the next four years are going to go by very quickly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. they need to be, they need to be ready. Mm -hmm. And the thing is, you can watch right now, there are already populist Republicans who are, who are very clearly gearing up for a presidential run in 2024, um, even if, if whether or not Trump puts his, throws his name into the hat again. Um, Ron DeSantis, the governor of Florida, um, Christy Noem, the governor of, of South Dakota, um, Senator Ted Cruz, these are just three of the more obvious figures who are very clearly positioning themselves to take over where Trump left off. And I think, uh, you know, will will they succeed in 2024? We don't know. But it's at that point that it's going to become very clear that it's not just, you know, the, the bad orange man. It's not just this one person. But it's a, an actual upsurge 
a movement on the part of the people who have been excluded from prosperity for way too long, who have been expected to um, take the short end of the stick so that the professional managerial class can, you know, can live in their nice cozy bubbles and convince themselves that all is well with the world. And the thing is, there were a lot of, this, this is an awkward situation because there are some things that the professional managerial class has been, at least to some extent, trying to do or paying attention to that need to be paid attention to. And there are some things going on among the working class, among the populists, that um, are very unfortunate. Um, attitudes toward things like climate change. But really, the managerial class has, has only itself to blame for this. I mean, we've seen how long now that when it comes to doing something about climate change, it's always, we've got to shut down this thing that benefits the working class. Uh, you know, we've got to shut down the coal mines. Heaven forfend that we should stop flying to, you know, wherever for our, for our vacations, which puts as much gunk in the air. It's all, let's punish the working class, but our lifestyles are not negotiable. That attitude has set the professional managerial class, has set the privileged classes up for a real fall. And unfortunately, it's going to be, it, it, it's going to be a mess. Yeah, when you've got, as you say, these, you know, climate summits, I can't remember which one it was, but there was a, <laughs> there was a notorious one that, uh, one of the press, uh, photos that was released at the time was of uh, a nearby airport and oh, all, all the, the private jets. Yeah, all those private jets. Yeah, that was. Where was that? I remember the one. I I made fun of it in uh, in one of my blogs, uh, one of my blog posts, be precisely because. Yeah, there's they, these private people are flying there on private jets. Oh, and there's also a bunch of rich people who came there in their gigantic motor yachts, boats that are longer than some vessels, you know, run by the British Navy. Okay, uh, and 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 all of the celebrity attendees had I forget which high performance sports car on call if they just wanted to get out there and take a drive. And this was to talk about the climate. It was hilarious because it made it very clear that the whole thing was, you know, we're going to keep all our lives filled. You are going to go live in a cave. Yeah, it's and like it was one of the so obvious. They were so blatant about it. Yeah, exactly. And I think that, that, that's an echo of what the complacency that you saw in the, especially from the Democrats in, in the US election, this idea that just more of the same, you know, that there is that illusion of inevitability. Um, mm -hmm. It turned out to be an illusion, but just the kind of like, we don't even have to pay lip service to this because what are you going to do? You're going to do nothing. And this is not <laughs> even going, this is not even going to be really reported on. So you're not even going to know about it. Pe mm -hmm. People like Bono from U2, for example, he's just the, 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 the poster boy for this sort of, um, attitude, mm -hmm. you know, and it's one of the mantras now of the, um, anybody who's been following my work recently will know about, um, the so-called great reset coming from, uh, you know, the uh, Davos, the World Economic Forum. And one of the mantras is, you know, it, it's 2030 and uh, you will own nothing and you will be happy about it. Well, a bit like, um, when all those, Blocks, Berlin apartment blocks were being bought up during the Weimar inflation. Some, mm -hmm. somebody owned the buildings. You know what I mean? So. <laughs> and of course, that's just it. That's just it. You will own nothing. We will own everything is the subtitle. The, the thing that blows me away about the whole Great Reset thing. Here we have, um, a bunch of, a bunch of people putting on their thinking caps. These are supposedly the best and brightest. They're, they're, you know, the, the top line intellectuals and rich, famous people, those, you know, who think of themselves as the smart kids in the room. What they came up with was a rehash of the Soviet Union. You know, you own nothing. The state owns everything and everyone will be happy in the worker's paradise. It's the same shtick. It's exactly the same shtick that was being marketed for communism back before we found out how that worked out. And so the, the point that one of the points that I drew from this is that they have literally lost the ability to imagine a, anything new. All they can do is rehash. It's like, it's like Hollywood, endlessly rehashing old movies and old comic strips and everything. There, there, is, there are no more new ideas there. They've run out. And so... All they can do is come up with some way to rehash an old idea, and so we get the Great Reset, which basically is trying to reinvent Stalin, 
and complete with, of course, we, we already have our um, our social justice show trials. So I mean, we're, we're fairly well along. You've got, I just can't take the guy, Klaus Schwab, the founder of the World Economic Forum, who's unfortunately kind of the mouthpiece for a lot of this. And he's up there like, oh, international stakeholders will cooperate globally. And he's like, sorry, I'm supposed to feel inspired by this. You know, <laughs> it's just, just, as you say, it's just like not this, you know, talk about flogging a dead horse. <laughs> that, that horse is not merely dead, it's extinct. <laughs> He's, flog he's flogging the skeleton of a dinosaur. <laughs> yeah, well, we'll see where all that goes. I mean, it's, mm -hmm. it, it's, it, it's, there's nothing new in it, as you say, really, but it's just oh, yeah. been, uh, I don't know if you've reality read Klaus Schwab's book, COVID-19, The Great Reset, and it was a struggle. I, I, ha I, have, a, I have a copy of it. I haven't gotten to it yet. Um, I'm waiting for some time when I have insomnia. I'm sure it will be a very effective treatment. Oh, it's it's pure technocrat speak. Really, you know, you, you really have to struggle I, I know the language. to. Yeah, exactly. I, I, I know. The the thing that I'm looking forward to, um, I want to compare it to something else. Everyone nowadays still, everyone who's who's following our end of things, still remembers the limits to growth, the original 1973 book that um, issued by the Club of Rome. Most people have completely forgotten about its sequels. It had a whole series of sequels, by the way. And the sequels were all basically Great Reset material. They were all, well, you know, here's this crisis and here's how we're going to fix it. And it's all the same technocrat speak. And it's all, it's the same ideas. And they're still stuck rehashing this. And, you know, this, it's, it suddenly occurs to me, this is the same thing that we've seen with Donald Trump. What happened when people, when, when Donald Trump was elected? An enormous number of people got stuck in a tape loop. They're just going, orange man bat, orange man bat, orange man bat, orange man bat, endlessly, as though they can't break out of it. And here we have the technocrats who are rehashing a set of ideas from 1974 as though they're fresh and new. And those ideas are ultimately borrowed from the, from, you know, the 19 teens and 1920s. So, this is, this is really strange. It's occurring to me just how strange this is. These are supposed to be the people who are pushing progress, who are leading us towards something new and different. And what are they talking about? They're talking about flying cars. I remember flying cars in comic books in the 1960s when I was, you know, playing with toy trucks. You know, they're talking about space travel, 1930s science fiction fantasies. There is something, I, it's, this, this is really, this is really striking me that there is something really strange going on here. These people are caught in a kind of loop. Yeah, I've got a Club of Rome book that I bought, uh -huh. but I think it came out in 1989. I was inspired to go, but when I originally read your book, The Long Descent, uh, mm -hmm. you must have mentioned the Club of Rome or something came up that made me mm -hmm. go and mm -hmm. dig that book out again. Now, I've not read it. I reread it then, but I haven't reread it since. But one mm -hmm. thing that occurred to me about the Great Reset was again just how it's this a whole book like thousands of words. It doesn't say really very much at all. Uh, you know, it, it, oh yeah. It, even if you're used to reading between the lines with this stuff, it's like, like I was doing imitating Klaus Schwab a few minutes ago. Like global stakeholders will cooperate simultaneously, and okay, you can imagine what that might mean. But it's just, oh my god, it just makes you want to gouge your eyes out with a teaspoon, doesn't it? You know, it's just, it's, it's, it's yeah. awful. Yeah, well, and, and that's, that, that's really striking. I, I'm, I'm going to want to look at that and see why is, why is this consistently getting such bad prose? Because that, that's actually, one of the things you learn when, when you write a lot is that writing is an extremely good measure of clarity. If you cannot write something clearly, it's because you can't, can't think it clearly. You haven't thought it through yet, and usually when I run into a problem, I'm working on working on one of my books, and I, you know, I'm, something's not coming clear. I, I typically have to go away and think about it for a while, because what it's what I'm realizing there is that I haven't quite understood what I'm trying to say, and of course, one of the things we we've seen with a lot of a lot of the pseudo intellectualism of late is precisely people who who actually haven't thought through what they're saying. They're just recycling buzzwords. But I wonder what's going on here. Because you're right, there is that very pervasive notion 
or the very pervasive habit, rather. There's a very pervasive habit in that end of the technocratic worldview to say as to say very little in a lot of words and to think that they're saying something. There was one, one of the one of the old Club of Rome books. This is from the seventies. New goals for mankind. Of course, they would call it humankind now, but it was. I remember reading it at the time and going, "What does any of this mean?" Yeah, exactly. It's like management speak. You know, whenever if you're anyone who's ever worked for a corporation. Mm-hmm. You know, every now and again, you'll get some sort of, you'll get a memo about something and you just, you have to read it twice or maybe three times. because like, what was actually being said here, you know? Yeah. And I, I wonder to what extent uh, the reasons for this in the Great Reset literature and some of the forerunners that you mentioned, whether it is mm-hmm. just literally they don't know they're doing it or whether it is, when I think, you know, corporate management speak, a way of kind of concealing something by mm-hmm. basically saying, well, you know, we've set every, or we set everything out. You know, sometimes politicians will use this, won't they? Like double speak. Mm-hmm. They'll say that they're going to do something, but it's, it's so vague that it, it covers almost everything that they could do in future. So plausible deniability and all that. Like mm-hmm. one mm-hmm. of the things mm-hmm. you look out for is if any politician is, is something controversial is put to them and they say, we currently have no plans to do that. That. <laughs> That means that it's already it, it's already underway, but they haven't formally planned it yet. Yes, exactly. Whereas you know they can't just say no. You know, are you going to um, are you going to issue biometric IDs? No, 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 no. We currently have no plans to do that. You know exactly. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it it is it is fascinating. You know, it occurs to me this could be something. Uh, maybe some of our listeners who have much more computer skill than I do, which would not be hard. I'm not very good at that. Um, but one of these text generator programs that produces nonsense, a Klaus Schwab text generator that will produce paragraphs about the Great Reset. Yeah, I've seen I a think few. It'd be, very, it'd be very easy to do because it's just a rehash- rehashing of the same cliches over and over again. And um, it could be quite funny. I, I, I look forward to seeing it. Yeah, well, hopefully somebody will take that and run with it. Because I've seen a few of those text generators. You know, they're, they're meme generators or sometimes they're quotation uh-huh. generators and they're based on a particular theme or a particular person. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. Uh, they're, they're very funny, if nothing else. Oh, yeah. And, and the hilarious thing is that um, in some cases, things generated by that have been mistaken for actual utterances. I'm thinking here of some of the fake um, social justice college or university academic publications that have been generated by text generators and actually placed with peer-reviewed um, journals. Yeah, I heard about that, actually. that's Exactly. Yeah. yeah, because all you have to do is hit the right buzzwords. And in the same way, a sort of great, re- you, you'd want a great reset generator with a reset button. Exactly. Perfect. <laughs> now, what I think we should do for uh, the second half mm-hmm. is turn to something that we haven't got to yet in your new book, Magic. Magic. So, yeah, exactly. No, because for a lot of people are that, um, probably thinking, what has this got to do with the 2016 election or the 2020 election? What's this got mm-hmm. to do with anything in politics? But if mm-hmm. you if you present it slightly differently, everyone's very familiar with, oh, yeah. I mentioned earlier, the role of propaganda and PR uh-huh. Uh, uh-huh. In in politics and also marketing and advertising in our everyday lives, you know, we're used to exactly. we're, we're we're very familiar with this, but that mm-hmm. basically set out the basic definition of magic, you know, the art and science of causing yeah. change, and then yeah. you can if you then map that onto um, mm-hmm. that political activity, the PR and propaganda, exactly. Uh, sim- exactly. symbolism, it becomes very, and you don't have to subscribe to any belief. Uh, in mm-hmm. the, you know, the, the power of the, how shall I put it? The mind matter interaction, you know, the power mm-hmm. of consciousness to affect reality as we experience it. But mm-hmm. whether you look at it in purely superficial terms or whether you go deeper as you do, something fascinating was happening then. That concludes part one of our interview. Part two will be available soon in the subscribers area at legalizefreedom.com. Legalizefreedom.com. <laughs>